Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. My name is Lauren Booth. I'm a journalist from Great Britain and a revert to Islam. I'd like to share with you today how I come to be sitting here with a hijab and as a Muslim. I've only been a Muslim for two years, since 2010, and before that, as a journalist, I worked for newspapers who regularly printed stories that made Islam seem as if it was a violent religion, a religion for women who were oppressed and men who were aggressive. But somehow, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a different plan for me. I suppose we can look back to our childhood to see where things begin. And I remember when I was around seven years old, I was always praying. At night time before I went to sleep, I would pray. Although I was raised in a Christian household, I never prayed to the Trinity. I never understood the Trinity in order to pray to it. But I did know that there was one God and I would pray to him. Very simple prayers. Dear God, please make my younger sister disappear for a little bit. Things like that, the things that we all do when we're young. But it's not easy uh, staying religious, believing in God in the modern world. And I, I'm embarrassed to say that I really thought that I was kind of a God of the universe. Because actually, the polytheism of today is the arrogance of the individual. You see, when I was a teenager, I was quite pretty and quite talented. So I thought the world and the universe did revolve around me. I remember my mum saying to me, you really think the sun and the moon and the stars go round you, don't you? And I said, yeah, I do. But you know, when Allah has a plan for you, whatever you think you're going to do, it will result only in Allah's plan being fulfilled. People often ask reverts, what was the first moment when you became aware of Islam? Well, I think the first moment I became aware that the universe wasn't what I thought it was, that reality was different to how I thought, was in 2000. I was watching television and a picture came onto the evening news and I'll describe it to you. It was of a young boy aged 15 years old and he had a stone, a rock in his right hand and he was about to throw the rock. And in the picture you could only see his back but he seemed so strong, so confident, so powerful that the, the back of this young boy took my breath away. And what was even more amazing was that just meters from this boy with the stone was a tank and the tank was pointing its gun at him, but he wasn't afraid. The boy's name was Faris Odeh. Faris Odeh came from a place called the Gaza Strip, which I'd never really heard of, in a place called Palestine, which I sort of knew. 10 days after that photo was taken and it appeared on my TV screen, that young boy was shot dead by an Israeli sniper. He bled to death, a bullet went into his neck. He was 15 years old, but I didn't know that at the time. All I knew was that something wrong was going on in the world and I wanted to find out what it was. In 2005, I was working at the Mail on Sunday newspaper in London, part of a group of newspapers that we can say mm, isn't very sympathetic to Islam. I can't really explain why, but one day in December, I went into my editor's office and I said I'd like to go to Palestine. The elections were happening in January 2005, this was December 2004, and I wanted to cover them for the newspaper. Amazingly, my editor said, here's a check for your expenses. Go for two weeks and make a story, find a story. So I arrived in Palestine in 2005 in January with three phone numbers on a bit of paper and no other contacts and no other idea about what I would find and I had a knot of fear in my stomach because somehow I did 
wonder if the Palestinians and the Muslims weren't terrorists. I wondered about my own safety. Of course I did. I caught a taxi from Tel Aviv airport and my driver was Palestinian. His name was Jamal. He said, you can call me Jimmy. Jimmy Jamal drove me from Tel Aviv all the way to Ramallah on my first ever day in Palestine. And in an hour and a half, he tried to teach me about 63 years of Israeli oppression of the Palestinian people. It was a very interesting car ride, as you can imagine. I remember at one point seeing a beautiful road on a hillside with nobody on it. We were on a rickety road in the valley. I asked Jamal why we didn't use the clear road with nobody on it, and he said, because I'm Palestinian, that's a Jews only road. If we go on that road, we'll be shot dead within maybe five minutes. Do you still want to go on that road? The interaction between servant and Allah really is when you say Alhamdulillah. As I didn't think in 2005, 6, 7 and 8 that I was actually looking for Islam, I wasn't seeking any knowledge. But you know what? Knowledge kept coming and finding me. One of the most amazing places that I was getting dawah from was from Somalian taxi drivers. In London, it, the majority of taxi drivers in North London are Somalis. And may Allah be pleased with them, because they are the secret army of Islam. Right now, as I'm speaking to you, somewhere in the world, a non-Muslim man or woman is getting into a taxi cab and the Somalian taxi driver is sharing a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that person is being filled with curiosity at least and possibly even love for Islam. So I would get into these taxi cabs and I would say Salam Alaikum because I'd been to Palestine and the driver would always be interested. You speak a bit of Arabic. Oh, you know a bit of Islam. And then they would say, as the prophet said to his wife, Aisha, da 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 da. And they would give me a hadith or a surah from the Quran. And it got to the stage where I looked forward to getting into these taxis and learning more. You see? My heart was being softened for Islam. Of course, each of us must have a relationship with the Quran. And I did open the Quran before I came to Islam, but only once. I was given a Quran on the streets of Al Quds, Jerusalem, by a young Palestinian man I'd never met before and I'd never see again. He said, This is a gift to you from the people of Palestine. Don't forget us when you leave us. When I got home, I opened the Quran. I washed my hands. I didn't know about wudu, but I opened the Quran and I thought, I like the Muslims. They're good people. Let me find out what their book says. But Al-Fatiha seemed strange to me. I turned more pages. The book seemed to be shouted commands and the voice seemed rather threatening. I felt scared. Imagine being scared of the Quran. But you know, Allah is the all-knowing and the all-wise. And if you come to the Quran in disbelief, or Allah has not prepared you for the Quran, it's not open to you. And at that point, it wasn't open to me. It was literally a closed book. I shut the Quran and I put it on a top shelf out of respect. And I never opened it again until after I'd said my Shahada. Can you imagine? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. You see, the Palestinian people thought the world actually cared about them at that moment. It was something great to be a part of. We were only supposed to stay three days and then t three days with the people of Palestine, then take the boats and leave for the safety of Cyprus. I had two young daughters who were in France. But somehow on the third day, I was there on the dock waving the boats away. My only certain exit from Palestine, from Gaza, was gone. I can't explain to you why I did that. Only Allah knows. It took me 30 days to leave Palestine. 
the Israelis wouldn't let me leave Eretz crossing and the Mubarak regime guards would not let me leave through Egypt. I was trapped. I was trapped in Ramadan, in Gaza, with Muslims under oppression. And what a lesson that would be, subhanAllah. I thank Allah every day for that opportunity to be with the greatest Muslims of the Ummah today, the people who can teach us all the meaning of Alhamdulillah, the meaning of Al-Fatiha. That's in Gaza right now. I remember one night I went to have iftar with a very poor family in a place whose name I remembered, Rafa, the refugee camp where you may remember Faris Odeh had come from. A woman opened the door of a room in the refugee camp and she said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. She seemed so happy I couldn't understand it. When I went in, she lived in a hovel. I asked her, why do you fast in Ramadan? It makes no sense to me. Your God makes you hungry. Your God makes you thirsty. Why are you fasting? This mother of Rafa turned to me and she said, with a face so full of light, I fast in Ramadan to remember the poor. I remember those words because she was so poor herself and she didn't seem to realize it because she was just grateful to Allah for whatever she had. And at that moment, a key went into my heart and the words came to me, if this is Islam, I'm in. But guess what? Allah calls us the insan. And the minute I left that refugee camp, I forgot the feeling, but Here's the miracle. In the intervening years, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never forgot me. Two years later, I went into a mosque during Ramadan and I said a simple prayer. And as I sat down, I was surrounded by such immense peace and joy that I knew Islam was the truth. Seven days later in London, I went into another mosque and I said the words, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And I became a Muslim. And now this is my second Ramadan. And my daughters are fasting with me. And our life is one of completeness and gratitude. Gratitude to Allah for guiding us to this beautiful faith. And gratitude to all of you for being my sisters and my brothers. So I make da'a that, like me, you will today recognize that Alhamdulillah is the strongest word we can be saying. Because you and I, we have freedom. You and I, we have children who are well. You and I, we have Islam. So please remember to thank Allah every minute of the day for the blessings he's given you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.